Uh, we're studying in First Thessalonians chapter four. Paul has uh, prayed uh, that this young church continue to abound in the faith and love that they have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and now he's uh, exhorting them uh, to do it, um, to abound in their uh, lives as Christians, in their trusting of the Lord, in their loving one another, in their proclaiming of his truth. All of those things that he has already acknowledged they were doing in the first uh, chapter of this book. <clears throat> and he says... Um, in verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you uh, through the Lord Jesus. He's exhorting them to walk in a manner that pleases God. And the walk that pleases God is a walk of obedience. And you cannot be obedient unless you understand the commands of God. They are not suggestions. They are commands. They are not given to make you spiritual. They are not given to earn your right into heaven, but they are given so that you can love him in the manner that Jesus calls us to love him. He says in John chapter 14 that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So Paul is exhorting them to live, that is to walk, in a manner that pleases God. We live under his grace. We were saved by his grace, but we do not tread on his grace. And by that, I mean, we seek under the control of the Spirit of God and by the direction of the Word of God to do His will. That's what we pray for, that His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray for that in our lives as well, that His will would be done in our lives. Last time we talked a little bit about some of the things that we know are the will of God. We said that it is the will of God in 1 Timothy 2.4 that we be saved. So if any of you here are not saved, then ignore the rest of these because none of them make any difference. Amen. You must be a child of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a saved person, you are now called to write, walk rightly relative to the Spirit of God who indwells you. And he says that you need to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. And then he says you, you need to worship in a selfless and sacrificial manner by presenting yourselves a living sacrifice in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says that we are to submit, submit to God, submit to one another, submit in the church, submit in our families. We are to be submissive people. That is the will of God, 1 Peter 2. And then, it may be that we'll be called to uh, suffer for Christ, and that too is the will of God. Suffering does not happen outside of the will of God, but within it. <coughs> and he says, um, I want you to, in verse 2, and you know what the commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So Paul refers back to his time of teaching with them as he uh, explained the scriptures to them and exhorted them to o obedience. And literally, as you read through this section, you're going to find a couple of places where Paul puts himself uh, in that place of being the spokesman for God. In other words, he claims apostolic authority. He, he indicates that this is, um, while he is giving them co the commandments, they are God's uh, commandments. And that's, the, that's true of all of scripture. All of Scripture is inspired by God, God's very words given to us by the writers of Scripture who all write under uh, apostolic or with apostolic authority. They speak uh, for God. 
says, uh, for this is the will of God. He says, you know the commandments through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then verse 3 says, These, this, excuse me, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So we, we've been through a number of things that are clearly the will of God, and there are many more things. I mean, you could literally say all, all of the instruction of the word of God is the will of God. It is God's will that we obey him and that we love him in that obedience and follow after him. That is the place of blessing. But in this particular case, uh, Paul speaks to a very specific issue, and that is <clears throat> the issue of our uh, sanctification. We talked last time about the fact that uh, sanctification in the New Testament speaks primarily about a practical sanctification. That is, we are all sanctified when we come to Jesus. That is, we are holy because we are given the righteousness of Christ. But now we live in this process by which God continues to transform us and conform us to the image of his son. And we call that process sanctification or practical sanctification. Sanctification simply means to be set apart. So you are set apart in your life to God. And you are set apart from sin and Satan and the world. And that's the process. You grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and as you grow in the grace of knowledge in Christ, you, you grow more like him as you grow more toward him. And more and more, your will is manifest as his will as you are more and more under the control of the Spirit of God. And the antithesis of that is our lives as we, as we move through this life in obedience uh, and uh, in the love of Christ is more and more to be set apart from the world, the world's values, the world's en entertainment, more and more set apart from sin and from the uh, influence or the lies of Satan. So <clears throat> this process of sanctification uh, cannot uh, take place and will not uh, take place uh, unless there's sexual purity in a person's life. Um, it, is, it is at the core of our sanctification process. It's absolutely uh, essential to our um, obedience to him and our being engaged in this process of growing in holiness, which is another word for sanctification. Now, in order for us to be obedient in that area, of our lives, <clears throat> Paul says we need to understand something. He says in verse 4 that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and uh, honor. You know, going to, to 2 Timothy, Paul speaks um, in a similar manner to Timothy while he's pastoring in Ephesus, <clears throat> and Timothy, Timothy being a young man <clears throat> under attack as a pastor in a number of different areas, but he calls uh, Timothy to this, and it's an exhortation uh, for us as well. In 2 Timothy verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verse uh, 20 and 21, he uses this uh, metaphor of vessels in the house of a person, uh, vessels for honor and vessels that are common, and he calls us all to be vessels for the honor of God, to be, to be able to be used by God for the highest callings that God would have in our life. So he says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And then he says, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid the foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. So Paul calls us <clears throat> to rightly live and rightly live as a vessel for God. It has an interesting um, connotation and denotation as well in that we are truly the vessels of God in that we are the vessels that contain the spirit of God which has been granted to us at salvation but what Paul is saying is you, you need not only to be saved but you need to be engaged in this process and you need to be cleansing yourself verse 21 therefore if anyone cleanses himself 
And, and that process is that process of continually seeking to allow God to show you your sins so that you can confess and turn uh, from it. <clears throat> and then you need to engage in your living to avoid those kinds of things that would um, that would sully or dirty the vessel. And that is you need to flee useful, uh, youthful lust. That is, there's a negative aspect to it. Free those passions and desires that are improper and present yourself positively toward righteousness, faith, love, and peace. That is the process that we are in working in, in, in the words of Paul in Philippians, working out our own salvation that is, while it's God that works in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We've talked about this a number of times. It is not let go and let God. It is, in fact, that we are called to make decisions, and those decisions that we're being called to make are decisions toward holiness and toward righteousness, avoiding those things that are unholy and unrighteous and seeking after those things that are. And by that, we will be cleansed as we deal rightly with those issues of life and confess and turn from sin. And God can then use us for the purposes that he desires in the places that he desires to use us, and we can be an honor to him. S same thing that Paul's talking about here in uh, Thessalonians as, he, as we come into uh, verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And that means, uh, he says in verse uh, 5, uh, to, um, to not, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. This is a very powerful uh, statement. It, it, what he's saying is, look, the Gentiles live their lives by emotion. They live their lives seeking to satisfy their passions and their wrong desires. That's who you used to be. Don't do that anymore. They have no choice in, a, in, the, in the real sense of things because they do not know God. In other words, they live based on who they are. Um, the, the pig that you pull out of the muck and clean up goes back to the muck because that's their nature and that's who you used to be. You used to be that kind of a person driven by your lusts and passions to the exclusion of your brain, right? But now you're not. N now you, you are a person that knows God. And this knowing God is, is not just uh, an understanding of who God is. It is that I idea of that intimate, knowing, loving relationship that you would have. It's a personal knowing. And in John chapter 17, uh, Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus whom you sent. What he's saying there is that when you come into that knowing, loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are given eternal life. In other words, you are brought to life. You participate in the life of God. So without knowing God, you do not have God's life. If you do not have God's life, then you're going to live the life of a dead pagan, a person without God and without the Spirit of God. So we are the antithesis of who we used to be. And that's the point that he's saying here. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. They live the way they desire to live because they have no eternal life. They have no life of God in them. But you are not like them. You are transformed. I heard a great example the other day on living as a Christian and living by, uh, by truth, by doctrine, by, by the truths of God because we know God versus the passions of life when we didn't know God. And it was, it was this example. I thought it was really good. So you go to the beach and you have your dog. Now, I'm not a dog lover, so this doesn't work for me, but, <laughs> but, but it'll work for a lot of you. So you have this dog. It's really... Uh, a part of your family. You love this dog. Th this dog is everything to you. You go to the beach, 
and you're near the beach and all of a sudden you look up and your little dog is out there in the waves drowning. And at the same time you look over and there's a person drowning within 15 yards of you. Now, emotion saves the dog. Theology saves the person. Emotion says, I want to save my dog, because I don't know that person from anybody. But theology says that person is a child of God. That, ch that person is loved by God. That person is an eternal soul. And that's where the value is. And I go there. I hope. I'm not sure all the time, but I'm hoping. <laughs> But that's the essence of it. Th that's a person that doesn't make their decision based upon what they feel. They make their decision based on what's right. And they know what's right because of what God says, yeah. not what seems right to them. And that, in the essence, is, is just a small snippet of what we have as Christians because, because we possess the life of God and we possess the Spirit of God in us and we have the Word of God to instruct us, we then, as we yield ourselves, can do what honors God. We can do what honors God, not what necessarily feels right to us or seems right to us. It is absolutely essential that we understand this. And something else you need to understand as we make these decisions for God, go with me to Galatians chapter 5, is that Paul is commanding them uh, to do these things, but he knows that it is not just them doing it in the flesh. It's not them just doing it in a, in a religious way or in a way that somehow brings uh, credit to them. It is rather that process that can only take place as the Spirit of God works in us because he calls them to self-control, which is actually spirit control. In Galatians 5.23, he says, well, 522, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and then in verse 23, gentleness and self-control against which there is no law. So if you are yielding yourself up to the Spirit of God, it will manifest itself in your desire to avoid those kinds of temptations that would lead you to sexual immorality and would move you toward righteousness and holiness. Self-control is a manifestation of the Spirit of God uh, in you, and that's what Paul is calling us to. We are not like we used to be, and Paul is reminding them of this as they are entering into life and the decisions of life. It's important for them because they come out of paganism. And most of the early churches that came out of paganism, particularly out of the Greek world, came out of a pagan world where sexual immorality was part of their religious practices and part of their society. I mean, the society was just rampant in its licentiousness and evil. So that as the churches formed by the Spirit of God, there is much that needs to be explained to them, and they need to be exhorted in the truth that they know uh, because they come out of such a debauched uh, background. And then he says in verse uh, 6, he says, uh, uh, let no one take advantage and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all such, as we also forewarned and uh, testify. Look, he's talking to the church, and he's talking to believers. He's talking to people that uh, are living their lives in and around one another, and he's talking about this particular issue. It's, it's absolutely critical that Christians not take advantage of one another in an improper way. Um, it's, it's Matthew 18, Matthew 18, <clears throat> in Matthew 18, <clears throat> uh, beginning in verse 6, he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, 
it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now this isn't, he's using a children, he's using children as an example. He's called a child before them. But, but it, isn't, it isn't the fact that they're a little child that's the issue. It's that a person in the kingdom of God is to be like a little child. It's a, it's a believer. It's a spiritual child. It's a spiritual child of his. That's, that's what he says. Jesus called the little child to him, set him in the midst, and said, And surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little children. And so what is he saying? He's saying if, if you're in that position in the church and you lead a child of God astray, then uh, you will face the judgment of God, the, the chastening of God. He is serious about the spiritual health of his children. And so he warns them here, back in Thessalonians then, he says, if you, if you defraud your brother, or could say sister in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all such, as we also forewarn and testify. If you're a Christian and lead another Christian into immorality, then uh, you're, you're destined to be chastened by God. That, what he's doing is, don't do that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a convicting thing. Uh, husbands, uh, you, you, you can't lead your wife into immorality. Um, now, now, the sexual relationship is for marriage, and Hebrews is clear that the bed is undefiled but it's fornicators and adulterers that will pay. So God has given the sexual relationship to marriage and to that couple. So that isn't what's in view here. The, but what is in view is to, to lead your wife or your husband into immoral activity, that is, into wrong places, uh, wrong activities, wrong entertainment. <laughs> Uh, you are responsible for their spiritual health. Don't do it. But obviously, the place that it, that this uh, is probably most <coughs> obviously prevalent in the church is uh, within uh, singles uh, relationships and singles ministry and those kinds of things in the church. And uh, it, this this should be taught um, to every singles class that uh, we, we are here to honor the Lord. Uh, we honor our Lord by our sexual purity. We are here to rightly possess the vessels that God has given us, and we are not here to entice one another uh, to sexual immorality. And I can't tell you, that it, it's just uh, discouraging sometimes to hear the instances where that kind of thing uh, takes place it's wrong and the person doing it is subjecting themselves to the chastening of God uh, by trying to take advantage of uh, a child of God. So not to do that and if you if you hear of that or you know of that you should go to that person and warn them and if that doesn't um, have effect then you should go to the leadership and talk about it. Um, we, we don't need um, people trying to take advantage um, of, uh, of those that are single in our midst. <clears throat> and then he says, um, he says, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but uh, to uh, holiness. Remember that we talked about that last time. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 1.15, be holy for I am holy, God says. It's not positional, it's practical. That's, that's what we desire to do. So it's a, um, it's a holiness that comes out of a love for Jesus Christ. It's a holiness that comes out of being under the control of the Spirit of God and a holiness that desires to love God in our obedience. But understand something, that's what we were called to. This is the efficacious call. This is the call of God uh, to his elect. This is essentially saying, I saved you. I saved you unto holiness not to be as you used to be. I saved you to transform you. I saved you for your worship and for your obedience and for your service, all of which can only be done as you seek uh, to rightly handle uh, your vessel in sanctification. Okay, um, in verse um, 8 he says, um, Therefore he who reject, rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Now again, here's another one of those verses. Paul says, I'm telling you something. Uh, 
I'm not telling you as a man. I'm not telling you as, um, a, as just another Christian. I am telling you that if you reject what I am telling you, you are rejecting God. You, so once again, Paul is uh, claiming uh, apostolic uh, authority in, in his words. And then he is reminding them, he says, that, that God has given you his Holy Spirit. In other words, the third person of the Trinity dwells in you. For all of the benefits that he brings, he also brings to you that reality that he will never lead you other than to holiness. So, I, I, you know, I, I, the number of times that people have come to me and said, well, um, I don't love them anymore, and God has brought this other person to me, and it just feels so right, and, um, and it has to be right if it feels so right. No, it's not. It's wrong. It's wrong because the Holy Spirit leads to holiness. The Holy Spirit leads to truth. The Holy Spirit leads to the, to the sanctity of your marriage. That's where the Holy Spirit goes. You go over here when you act like a pagan, when you allow your emotions and your improper desires to drive your decisions. Don't do that. So we are the... 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19 says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the residence of God. How can we allow ourselves to get entangled in the sinfulness of the world that used to own us? We need to be engaged in this struggle. And we've talked about it so many times. It is, a, it is in fact a warfare. It is in fact a struggle. It's a struggle against the sin that still comes to us and in us. It's a, it's a struggle against the lies of Satan, it will always be there until we go home, and we will find ourselves losing that sometime. But the, but the tension in that is while we lose it, we just hate what's happened, we turn from it, and the Spirit of God moves us and cleans us as we confess, and we continue on with our life because God wants us to have a victorious life over those issues of sin and Satan and the devil. It's a tension. I mean, it's, it's a tension. We, we, we are never satisfied with where we are in our walk with the Lord. We always know that God has more work to do in us, and yet we are always content in Him and the reality that we are saved and safe by the fact that Jesus died for us and we have His righteousness. God hates sin, and we need to deal with it that way, but God gives us victory by his word and by his uh, spirit. He says in verse 9, uh, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write you. Boy, that's really good. And wouldn't, wouldn't you hope that he could write that to us? I don't, I don't have to talk to you guys about brotherly love because you're just doing it so well. Yeah. Right? You're just loving each other so well. He says, for you yourselves are taught by God uh, to love one another. God, by, by his spirit and by his word, God has taught you. I don't need to reinforce that. You guys are doing a wonderful job. And if you go back to chapter 1 and again in chapter 3, Paul has talked about these people's love. It's an amazing love for one another and the love for the lost. Uh, God has done a, a miraculous work as he's pulled these people out of idolatry. But he says in, in verse 9, uh, he says in verse 10, and indeed, uh, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. I, I love that. Um, you're doing great, but just do more. <laughs> but again, that's, that's what sanctification is. Sanctification is never being satisfied. It's that, we talked about, it's that holy discontentment. It is, it is the joy of Christ in your life, and yet it's the realization that until I get to heaven, sin is going to be a battle, and I've got to battle it, and I need to yield myself up to the Lord. So I need to rejoice in Him, but I need to be vigilant against sin, and I need to be um, sensitive to it and hate it when I see it in my life. You know, we're going to break here, um, and we're gonna, we've got a guest to introduce. Uh, there's, there's, uh, we're just coming into some really good uh, scriptures, so don't go away next week. It'll, it'll be uh, something to talk about. Uh, let's pray for a second. Father, thank you uh, for our time together. I want to thank you right now for the food we're going to have today, Lord. What a joy. Thank you for all the hands that prepared it. Thank you for the wonderful fellowship that comes with it, Lord. So we just give you the thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.